اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الحمد للہ الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدی لولا ان هدان اللہ والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین سیدن الممجد بشیرن المصدق المصطفى الامجد محمود الاحمد ابي القاسم محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنه الله على الظالمين من الاولين والاخرين اما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم على سرر موضونة متكئين عليها متقابلين يطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون بأكواب وأباريق وكأس من معين لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون وفاكهة مما يتخيرون ولحم طير مما يشتهون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam. My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Azzam Allah wa Ajurana wa Ajurakum bi Musabinah, Abi Abdillah al-Husayn salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. Arguably there are five ways in which we can serve and join ourselves to the master of the martyrs, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. There are five potential ways in which you and I can serve Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. One of them is arguably incorrect. Three of them have merit one of them is the complete way when we bring in the other three that have partial merit to it let us mention these five and think about the way in which people serve imam al hussein alayhi salam the way in which the imam himself describes his position Versus that of Yazid bin Muawiyah And then think about What are the different ways in which we can ensure That we are serving Imam al Hussein alayhi salam As he deserves to be served His movement and message deserves to be served There are five ways The first is seasonal the period of Muharram and Safar comes and goes, and so too does our participation with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam come and go. The second is emotional. This has some merits, but it also has some potential weaknesses in it. The third is intellectual. This also has great merit, but also has some potential pitfalls the fourth is to follow imam al hussein alayhi salam by action which has all of the potential merits in it but there is only one potential drawback and then the fifth way one can serve imam al hussein alayhi salam is the most complete way which is to serve imam through all of the previous but also through action and to be able to ensure that they avoid everything that their enemies stand for. And when we ensure that there is an emotional element, an intellectual element, 
the act that we do follows Imam and we also separate ourselves from the practices of those whom he opposed, those who are the enemies of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, then this is the complete way in which we can serve and follow Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Sarawatullah wa Salamuhu alayhi. Think with me for a couple of minutes about each of these five different ways. The first one was seasonal. What we mean is that when the days of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam approach, the way in which our behaviors change, not permanently, but temporarily, because we honor the season of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam without having truly honored the Imam himself. The season comes and many for us, it will start when either Imam al Hussein alayhi salam departs Mecca or maybe from the point in which Hazrat Muslim ibn Aqil alayhi salam is martyred or maybe for the first of Muharram, the black cloth comes. Our attendance is now going to be for 12 or 14 nights or whatever it may be. There is a season, the ayyam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are upon us. We also know that there are certain cultural practices that come in. And of course, some of them are very good. But some of them are only done temporarily without thinking through what these practices mean. For example, we often know that there are some that will, for example, switch off haram music in the month of Muharram, or at least in the Ashra or something like this, or maybe until Eid al-Zahra. And so their activities, of course, are in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. They will say to honor Imam, we will switch off the haram music. We will stop watching haram, whatever it may be. But the moment the black cloth goes down, or the moment the ashra finishes, then the haram returns. Actually, what we are doing is we are belittling Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and we are also belittling Allah Jalla Jalalahu. And in reality, this action is actually a mode of shirk. To say that I will stop doing something that I know is haram for the sake of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and not for the sake of Allah Jalla Jalalahu knowing that it is haram, but then actually reverting back to it the moment that the season in my mind finishes, is actually reducing the movement of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Yes, it is good to stop doing the haram for one day, for 10 days, for a year. But the goal shouldn't be to switch off haram for 10 days. The goal shouldn't be for us to be able to switch off haram for two months and eight days until Eid al-Zahra comes. You see this especially amongst youth in the internet culture. Those of you who are online and you're part of kind of that, you know, Twitter scene, Instagram scene, maybe even TikTok. Some of these are borderline very, very problematic. But you will often see, especially when Muslims come to the month of Ramadan. It's great. Everyone says fantastic. There is great effort put in. But if the niyyah was only to start praying for one month, if the niyyah was that, you know, I'm going to avoid haram, but on the day of Eid, I'm going to dress up in makeup, dress my best, put my picture out there so that I can get as many likes as possible, have as many guys DM me as possible. Then what you really are saying is nothing was really learned. The action was there. You fasted. I fasted. We were there present on Qadr nights, but did it actually take any effect on me? Because the moment the day of Eid came, my behavior shifted again. Similarly, for many of us, the moment the day of Ashura finishes, our behaviors revert. Or maybe after two months and eight days, the behavior reverts. This is the seasonal Muslim or the seasonal lover of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. This can be improved upon. And if any of us have this, we should try to reflect on whether we are moving with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam for 10 days or whether we want it to be as a permanent feature of our life. This is one. 
Second is emotional. To be emotionally tied to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is amongst the most incorrigible things that we can do. To weep for Imam al Hussein loudly. To go out of our way to find a majlis that is remembering Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is amongst the best of the things that we can do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that love for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is not mustahab. It's not even mustahab mu'akkid. It's not something that's just highly recommended. It is wajib for you and I. Qul, la as'alukum alayhi ajr illa al mawaddata fil qurba. Love, unadulterated, overwhelming, overflowing love for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is what is expected from us. And all of us here reach that level, inshaAllah. And none of us can put a lid back on what has already been opened since we were born. But we also have to realize that simply love in and of itself is good, but it is not complete. It is not the only part of the way in which we are to engage with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. It forms one of the ways in which we engage with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. There is also the intellectual way. And for many of us, when we come to the movement of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, we want to understand the movement of Imam, not through a dogmatic way. We want to read his sayings, his sermons. We want to understand his movement for ourselves. We want to understand the theology, the ideology of that movement for ourselves. But of course, there is the drawback. Because potentially, if we only approach the movement of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam intellectually, without understanding the emotion of it, without understanding the application of it, then we are potentially leaving ourselves open to having theories that might not necessarily be correct. And so we are more engaged in the intellectual debate about Imam and Imam's movement without understanding the other aspects that have to come into the movement as well. So it's important. Intellectually is very important. The fikr or the fikriyan approach has a huge role to play, but it cannot be the only way in which we approach Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So we have the seasonal, we have the emotional. And we also have the intellectual. Another way to approach Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is by adopting his actions. And many of us are doing this. We understand that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam stood for truth and justice against all oppression and did not fear one iota of any arrow that might have approached him. If it meant giving his life, his wealth, his family, and his companions, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was ready to do this. And so many of us have adopted this as well. And so when it comes to the movement of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, we want to adopt the actions of Imam. Again, this is almost at the full quality of Imam. But we also realize that part of our adopting the actions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam means to be able to avoid everything that was represented by the a'da of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the other side, by Banu Umayyah, by Yazid, by Ibn Ziyad, by all of these accursed individuals and the system that they represent. On the night of Qadr, especially on the 19th and 21st, we make a tasbih. We say, Allahumma al-an qatalata amir al-mu'mineen. Oh Allah, curse the killers of Imam Amir al-mu'mineen alayhi salam. Why? Why do we say this a hundred times on the night of Qadr? Because what we are actually saying behind those words is, Oh Allah, I recognize what the killers of Amir al-mu'mineen stood for. Their jealousy, their envy, their hatred, their greed, their laziness, and all that they stood for, 
I do bara'ah from that. Oh Allah, on this night of Qadr, ensure that not only do I have the qualities of Amir al Mu'mineen, but I also am far, far away, distanced from the qualities of the enemies of Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. This way, when we think about this, we come to approach the movement of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, not seasonal, but we bring the emotion that is required. We bring the intellectual side that is required. We bring the action to apply ourselves, but we also ensure that the things that are letting us down, we try to remove from ourselves. Our fourth Imam, Zainul Abidin, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh, has a famous ziyarah which is related by the fifth Imam from his father, the fourth Imam, which is related to us by the great companion Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari. Very famous, it is Ziyarat Aminullah, the ziyarah for Imam Ali alayhi salam. Hands up here, how many of you have had the honor of standing at that gate in Najaf? How many of us? May Allah take you all, inshaAllah, this year and every year. The recommended ziyarah at the gate, the point of entrance into the dharih room of Imam is ziyarat aminullah. I want you to see just this section of the way in which a sajjad alayhi salam describes the importance of the actions of both applying yourself to the Imam's actions, but also learning to separate from the actions of his enemies. Allahumma faj'al nafsi mutma'innatan biqadrik. Oh Allah, please cause my soul to be fully tranquil with your decrees. Radiatan biqadaik, satisfied with your acts. Why did Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam say this dua at the door of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam? Because of what Ali ibn Abi Talib had to go through in his life and the way Ali ibn Abi Talib was satisfied with the decrees of Allah Jalla Jalalahu, we are also learning to be satisfied with the decrees of Allah Jalla Jalalahu. Make me mula'atan bi dhikrik wa du'a'ik Fond of constantly mentioning and praying to you Muhibbatan li safwati awliya'ik Bearing love for the choicest of your intimate servants What did we say? One of the ways in which we could serve Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was firstly seasonal The second was Emotional through love. Oh Allah, make it muhibbatan li safwati awliya'ik. Make it that I am bearing love for the choicest of your servants. Mahboobatan fi ardhika wa sama'ik. Those who are the most beloved in your lands and in your heavens. Sabiratan ala nuzuli bala'ik. Those who are steadfast against the affliction of your tribulations shakiratan li fawadili na'ma'ik thankful for your graceful bounties make it O oh allah that i am thankful for your graceful bounties dhakiratan li sawabighi ala'ik and always bearing in mind your incessant gifts now i'm focusing on these two lines for a second Shakiratan, O oh Allah, make me Shakiratan li fawadili na'ma'ik Thankful for the graceful bounties that you have given to me Dhakiratan li sawabighi ala'ik Always bearing in mind your incessant gifts Mushtaqatan ila farhati liqa'ik Longing for the gladness of meeting you, O oh Allah. Meaning what? Longing for death. Ready for death. Longing that when death comes, 
I am ready to meet with you, O oh Allah. Mutazawidatan at taqwa li yawmi jazaik. Supplied ready with piety for the day of reward. Mustanatan bi sunani awliya'ik. That I am always pursuing the sunan, the practices of your awliya, of your choicest of servants. Mufariqatan li akhlaqi a'da'ik. And that I am far away, separated, quitting the conduct of your enemies, Allah. And I am mashghulatan anid dunya bihamdika wa thana'ik. Distract from this world because I am overwhelmed in praising you and in thanking you. This is how Imam al-Sajjad describes his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the learning of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib ajma'een. What I want to be able to think about here tonight is what you and I can do in our lives to actually have this level where we are following the sunnah of Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam down to a T as much as we can. And that we are grateful for the blessings of Allah. We are overwhelmed by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his various different blessings. You know, there are many different sunnah that would come to us from Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalam, right? There are so many and sometimes you can, you, you know them so well, but sometimes it becomes a little bit overwhelming and sometimes we leave them. Because they become so ordinary or mundane in my mind that maybe I forget them. Do you know how detailed Islam is about every single action that you and I have? Think about this. Right now, you are all wearing black, dark colors. Why? It's a sign of grief and mourning, isn't it? Did Islam forget even the color of your clothes? No. When you walk into the bathroom, you walk in with one leg. When you walk out, you walk with another leg. When you walk in, you walk in with your left. When you walk out, you walk out with your right. You know when you finish your sajda, your second sajda in salah? Everyone does their two sajda, right? Sajdatain in salah, right? And you get up. What do you say? Bihawlillahi ta'ala quwwatihi wa qumu. When you get up, who can tell me what are the different ways people lift themselves up? <laughs> this is actually right. Yes, yes. So have you here said with your feet, you lift yourself up. So you're sitting, you finish your second sajda and you want to get up and you push yourself off with your feet. What are the other ways? Sometimes people put the tips of their fingers, don't they? they? They bend over, they put their tips of their fingers and they push themselves up, correct? Maybe others I've seen, they kind of put their fists clenched and they push themselves up. Do you know, even within the sunnah of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, it is described how you actually get up from sajda into your next rak'ah? How detailed Islam is. It actually is that you put your palms all the way down flat and then push yourself up with the bottom of your palms. So you use your arms to push yourself up first and then you get up. Just think about this for a second. How detailed every aspect of our life is. Here in this dua, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam says the one, one of the things I want from you, O Allah, in this place, not if I, I want it in this place, Ya Allah. Mustannatan, mustannatan bi sunani awliya'ik. Pursuing the sunan, the practices of awliya'ik, of your choicest of servants, those who are proximate and close to you. Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahu salamu alayhim ajma'een. For you and I, 
to be able to follow Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, to follow Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam, means that we try as best as we can in all of these actions, small, small actions, we follow them to the highest point of perfection, such that at every point we become a representation of Islam itself. This is actually something that some of the maraj have stated. His Eminence, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayh, he actually has a, a will that he left, or he gives a spoken will. He said, you know, what will you say as your farewell to people? And he said something phenomenal in there. Sayyid Fadlullah, he said, amongst his statements, he said that, I want you to know of my life, that my life became a representation of Islam in its entirety. Now, of course, he's not saying boasting here, I am ma'asum or something like this. He's saying that I worked so hard that at every point, every little detail of my life, I was given 70 years and at the end of it, I had reached a point that if you saw me, if you watched me, if you engaged with me, it could be seen as a reflection of Islam proper. This is where you and I want to be able to reach. Every moment you're remembering Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. At every moment there is death. At every moment there is commitment to Allah. At every moment there is awareness of the perfect responsibility that can be interacted, that can be enacted at that moment. And this is when a person actually becomes a blessing of Allah to other people. Prophet Isa alayhi salam, he has a very beautiful ayah in the Quran. He is quoted by Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Isa alayhi salam is saying, I am mubarakan aynama, aynama kunt. Allah made me mubarakan, blessed, aynama kunt. Wherever I went, in every circumstance, I was actually blessed, such that every moment was a lesson from me. At every moment, I led the most supreme, pristine life that someone could look and say, this is a replica, this is a mirror of Islam itself. Once, some of the scholars of the West went to one of our grand maraji and visited him. And the scholar who went, there was two scholars, one of them told me this story himself directly whilst we were in Hajj, whilst we were, or maybe, sorry, it was Umrah, not Hajj, whilst we were in Umrah and whilst we were on the bus in Umrah, I think we were going from uh, Mecca to Medina or Medina to Mecca, I forget which one, but we were on the bus and I convey this story to you. So he said he and another scholar went to go visit one of the Maraja. This Marja, may Allah bless him, is a giant of a scholar with us until now. He said, we went, we were invited for the opportunity to be able to have some lunch with this scholar. And when we sat with him, he said, I noticed that there was one action that I saw in him that overwhelmed me that I had never seen another human being be, another human oh. being do Allah Hamak. Another, see this is a sunnah, <laughs> right? When he sneezes, you say Allah Hamak to him. I watched this scholar eating and I have never seen a practice from another human being the way in which he did this. And I remember thinking to myself that every moment of his in front of me is a blessing because I'm learning from him Islam in its proper way. What was that action? He says that every morsel, every morsel that this marja took to eat 
when he was chewing it, at the end of having swallowed that little morsel of food, he would just say, Alhamdulillah. He would just remember and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that morsel of food. He said at every point he was remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at every point we would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by virtue of the piety that was radiating from him. Isa alayhi salam said, Allah made me mubarakan aynama kunt. Blessed wherever I am. In whatever situation you find me in, pressure, battlefield, sitting, lying down, there is never a moment that it is not spreading blessings to those people or the creatures around you. The scholar said when we departed, you know, you don't want to take too much of this guy's time, the manager has got time, he's got busy schedule, decides to leave. He walked us out of his house and he made a dua for us. He said, oh Allah, may Allah make you blessed, mubarakan, aynama kuntum as well. May Allah make you also blessed wherever you go. Now the point I make is that if you think about the level of the potential that exists within us, that if we are able to just practice the small things that could make us present before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that could shift the practices such that that one practice becomes so perfect that I become the perfect reflection of Islam itself. Wouldn't that be an honor before I die, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What did you become, my servant? What did you achieve, my servant? I manifested your deen in its full perfection in this one area of my life. Many of us try it. We make sure that our salah is as good as possible, don't we? There is special attention placed, especially our elders. May Allah bless our elders. You, if you watch someone as they grow older, their mindset, what is important to them begins to shift. Right? You will see that they become much more engaged in their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their wudu becomes slower, more in tune with its different ad'iyah, more in tune with the different rites of it. Everybody knows that there are ad'iyah to recite when you're performing your wudu, right? Oh Allah, bayyid wajhi, oh Allah, make my face, you know, pure and shining. On the, day for, on the day of judgment when this face has to meet you. When other faces are going to be dark on the day of judgment. Oh Allah, give to me my book in my right hand and not my book of deeds in the left hand. All of these are different ad'iyah that you can recite. People when they come to their salah, they will make sure that they have something to be able to make them smell beautiful. They make sure they recite the adhan and the iqama. Even if they're on their own, the hadith. From our fifth Imam Muhammad al Baqir, Salawatullah wa Salamuhu alayhi. Imam alayhi salam is narrated to have said that the one who recites Adhan before his Salah, even if you are on your own, the one who recites Adhan for his Salah, Allah sends a row of angels to pray behind them, the length of which are from the east to the west. And then the one who recites the iqama, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also send another row of angels to stand behind him, the length of which spans from the east to the west. Sunnah, small sunnah. You don't have to be here to recite adhan and iqama. His eminence, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi al-Mudarrasi, in one of his clips, he says, some of us, we do actions specifically in the Husayniyyah in the masjid, but for some reason, we don't do them at home. You'll find someone, he loves to come to the masjid. He loves reciting adhan. He is the mu'azzin. At home, you will never see him reciting adhan. You will never see him making sure that there is salat al-jama'ah in front of everyone. First there to make sure I'm in front of the mic to recite the adhan. Make sure we can call everyone towards salat al-jama'ah. At home, 
Where is the Salat al-Jama'ah? The point I make is that we know so many of the Sunan of Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as -salam. When we practice these, when we try to include them into our life, our life no longer becomes that I'm rushing from here to there to there to make my life catch up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, my life is a representation of Islam proper. And in everything that I do, it is nothing short than the perfect example of the Prophet himself. Someone can look at you and say, this is something that is reflective of the Prophet's message itself. What I want to do for the rest of the discussion tonight, inshallah, and then we continue for the rest of the nights, inshallah, is for us to be able to pick one sunnah, one action that we do, and to assess the various different sunnah of it, so that we could try to implement some of those things that perfect our practices, so that we are totally engulfed in the perfect way to do things, as per the Quranic directive, as per the sunnah of Ahl al-Bayt alayhim So we gave the example of salah a minute ago. We can do these small, small things and it will improve our salah, improve our spirituality until the act of salah becomes a perfect manifestation of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes normal for us in our lives. We're going to pick one sunnah. And it is very much in line with the series that we have been doing thinking about our responsibilities. This sunnah is the sunnah of eating. The sunnah of eating. Because what we put into our bodies is going to become what we are. You know, every part of our body regenerates itself. Every part. We're constantly, our skin cells are dying and then we're replenishing them, recreating them anew. Parts of our body, be it our liver, every part of our body is constantly replenishing itself. Different parts of our body replenish itself at different paces. Different organs take a different time. So over a span of a cycle, we become an entirely new person actually. You've all heard that famous saying, you are what you eat. Why? Because what you put into your body is actually going to become the manifestation of that body. What you put into your body is going to be reflected into your soul. And so if we can perfect one sunnah and we can ensure this one activity that we do, sometimes two times a day, three times a day. Some of us become very hungry. It's five, six times a day. Yeah. If we can make sure that this one act is pristine, it reflects the perfection of this act, then imagine how it can lead into the other actions of our life. What I'm going to show you is the commentary, the tafsir of Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi Al-Mudarrasi. And I'm also going to expand upon it a little bit. I'm going to use the ayat that he uses to explain. And then I will open it up a little bit further, inshallah, for you and I to be able to benefit from. Everyone, open your Qur'ans, inshallah. Who can remind me, what was the chapter that we are going to be studying tonight? Chapter number 56, Surat. Surat Al-Waqi'ah. Jazakumullah khair. And verse number 15 to 21. In this sequence, His Eminence Sayyid al-Marja al-Mudarrasi says that when you do tadabbur of the Qur'an, when you ponder upon the Qur'an, one of the techniques of pondering upon the Qur'an is what is known as the siyaq of the Qur'an. The siyaq of the Qur'an, maybe if I can loosely translate it, will be the coherence, the, 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 the sequence of that passage of verses of the Quran. Maybe that's the way I could explain it in this way. So sometimes when you read an ayah, sometimes the ayah has several bits to it, doesn't it? There's a siyaq. There's an internal coherence. 
one part follows to the other, to the other, to the other. And there's a relationship between the first part and the last part, isn't there? The first part and the middle part. Similarly, when you read five ayat, ten ayat, if they're in a block, they also have an internal relationship with one another and they expand on one another. There's a sequence to them. In this set of verses, Ayatollah al-Mudarrasi says that this set of verses gives you the sequence, the order by which you and I are supposed to participate in any meal. You know why? Because this meal that is being served in these ayat are not meals that are being served in dunya. This set of verses is the meal that will be served to you in Jannah, insha'Allah. Is there anything more perfect than Jannah? If Allah Jalla Jalaluhu describes to you the scene, the setting, the order of the occasion of feasting in Jannah, then this is the way it should be in dunya as well. That is the perfect way that it's going to be. There's no sin, there's no mistake, there's no lowness in anything in Jannah. You're going to be served by the malaika themselves. And so they can only do things as per perfection, as per the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this set of verses, it is actually telling you how you're going to be served food in the order and the sunnah. When I say sunnah, I mean practices that are going to be in Jannah itself. Which means, Ayatollah Mudarisi says, learn that if this is the way it is done in Jannah, learn to be able to practice it in dunya. He takes every verse and expands upon it. And this is where we get a hadith and we bring in hadith, we bring in the stories to be able to explain the different sequence. Everybody, let's have a look at these ayat insha'Allah and think about our own selves and what you and I can do. I'm just going to read the verses and then I'm going to expand upon them afterwards insha'Allah. Think about the order for yourself. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Where will you be? Insha'Allah ala sururim mawdunah. They will be seated on gold-encrusted couches. Now, first and foremost, Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam state, many, many ahadith, that when you come across a verse of the Qur'an talking to you about hellfire, warning you of hellfire, what are you supposed to do? A stop and say, may Allah... Protect me from that punishment that is being mentioned. And when you come across a verse of Jannah, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam in the hadith says, stop at it, ask Allah, oh Allah, give me that reward for myself. This is a statement from Imam, very famous hadith. So all of you, inshallah, when, when you read Quran, maybe we don't realize there is even a sunnah to reading the Quran. Inshallah, we will come to this. The sunnah to even read the Quran, huh? So now we've read this ayah, ala sururin mawdunah. What are you supposed to do? Oh Allah, make it that we are able to be sitting on those kinds of couches that have been mentioned. Ya Allah. What will you be doing? Muttaki'ina alayha mutaqabideen. Reclining on them face to face. Meaning what? Are you going to be on your own here in Jannah? No, you're going to be with people in Jannah, insha'Allah. Oh Allah, make it that I am sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Oh Allah, make it that I'm sitting with Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Oh Allah, make it that I'm sitting with my mother and my father. Oh Allah, make it that I'm sitting with my brother and my sister and my wife. And you see, muttaki'ina alayha mutaqabileen. What else will be happening? يَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلْدَانٌ مُخَلَّدُونَ Immortal youths, pearl boys, will be going about you, serving you, looking after whatever you need. Whatever your deepest requirement is, they will be serving every single thing that you want. I remember once someone asked me, what do you want in Jannah, inshaAllah? And I remember I was a lot younger, and I said, I would like a five-a-side football game with Ahlul Bayt, alayhim So I want, it's me, the Prophet, 
Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. That's, that's our five. And then inshallah, it will be the other imma. So you go all the way. The next ones, it will be the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth imam. And then from the ninth to the twelfth, and I think Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam makes up the, the other. So it's a five-a-side knockout competition. Yeah. But then they say, what do you mean? How, how, how's that going to work? You know, the, the moment one of the imams comes to try to score against the prophet, the prophet is going to be such a generous human. Please, Fadl, go ahead and score. And now the imam, how, how can I score against my grandfather? So what is heaven going to be like? What do you want? What do you want from this heaven? Allah Jalla Jalala who is saying to you, these servants of yours, the good deeds that you did, they're manifesting into servants for you. They're going to be going around you, working hard. They're going to be these immortal youth that are going to be at your every beck and call. What, what's going to be happening? Bi akwabin wa abariqa wa ka'sim min. Ma'een. They will have goblets and cups filled with drinks from a running spring. They will go about with them with fruits of which you will have choice over whatever fruits that you want. And with flesh of any type of animal that you may desire to be able to eat from. This is the, the scene that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is creating for you. Now what we have to remember is that there are an abundant number of sunnah of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam that expand upon this. The first thing the ayah says, you will be ala sururim mawdhuna. So you will be sitting on these beautiful couches, these beautiful gold-studded couches. The sunnah of Ahlul Bayt salam tells us that we are supposed to sit in a particular way when it comes to participating in a meal. This hadith comes to us from Ibrahim ibn Abbas who said about our eighth imam, Ali ibn Musa al-Rida salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. I have never seen Abu al-Hasan al-Rida alayhi salam hurt anybody with something he said, nor have I ever seen him interrupt anyone until he had finished, nor have I ever seen him refuse someone a favor when he was able to do it, nor did I see him stretch out his legs in front of someone when sitting with them, nor lean against something that his own companion did not have available to lean against, nor did I see him ever insult one of his workers. I have never seen him spit or burst into laughter. Rather, when he laughed, it was just a balanced chuckle and smile. When he was ready to eat at the table that had been laid out for him, he seated with him at the table all of his servants, including even the person who would open the door for him and his stable boy who would look after his horse. Can you see? There's a sunnah here of how you sit with people. Even the great prophets spoke about this. Luqman alayhi salam has a hadith where he actually tells his son, Luqman, the wise, tells his son, he's bringing up his son. He says, oh my son, be discerning of the gatherings that you sit in. Not every gathering is worth of your time. If, if you go to a gathering and you find therein there is the remembrance of Allah, then you join in and sit in it. Why, my son? If you have knowledge, your knowledge will become of benefit in a gathering where Allah is being mentioned. And if you are ignorant by virtue of that gathering, your ignorance will be removed. But oh my son, if this gathering is one where Allah is completely forgotten and there is nothing going on to remember Allah, if you come with your knowledge, your knowledge won't benefit you, nor will it actually benefit them. They won't want to hear it from you because they're too engrossed in wasting their time. They will shun you. They will laugh at you. They will have something against you in their hearts. And if you have ignorance in you, my son, by virtue of what they are doing, 
your ignorance will come out even further. They would exploit the ignorances, the weaknesses, the deficiencies within you. This is the advice from Luqman alayhi salam to his son. So number one, the ayah said that we will be ala surarim mawdhuna. We will be inshallah sitting on gold encrusted couches. Muttaki'ina alayha mutaqabileen. Reclining on them, sitting face to face, one and in front of another. According to the a hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim was salam, it is makroo for us to be able to eat on our own. And it is highly mustahab for us to be able to eat with people and share in food. Imam Ali alayhi salam is a hadith where he said, the most blessed of food is the one that has met the most number of hands. It is makroo for you to eat on your own. Wait. Unless you have to, you know, sometimes you come home late from work, it's only you. Fine, I understand there are circumstances. The principle is always try to share your food with somebody. That food is actually a social thing. Now, this is very important and I'm going to address my youth here especially and myself. For I am the first to have to deal with this problem in myself. In the way in which we live in the Western societies, we have developed a big problem when we eat, and that is that we either eat with the TV on or with our phones. True? We sit staring watching phones. We sit staring watching TV. In Islam, the sunnah is to be face to face, speaking, talking, learning, enjoying with each other. The Western sunnah is to be glued to this box and I'm telling you that there are so many studies done on specifically the damage to individual health and familial health of eating food, eating your lunch or dinner whilst watching the TV. I will send you as many as you want. Whatever you are, I will, when I talk to you about these scientific studies, it's because I have them available. I've read them and I've been studying them. I'll give you one. There is a particular type of chemical that is released in the stomach to tell you when you are full up. This is very important. There's a chemical that is released in the gut that tells you, oh, I'm done. Now the issue with this is that this chemical that's released in the stomach, it takes sometimes 15, 20 minutes for it to be released. Because when we eat, there's a process, isn't it? The digestion has to start, and then once it starts, then we can start seeing the food digesting into the body, and then of course other processes start happening in the brain. It's not an immediate action, is it? It takes some time, there's a delay reaction, 15, 20, 25 minutes, depending on the rate in which every individual eats at. Now think about this very carefully. If you're used to just eating, 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 second helping, eating, 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 third eating, third helping, eating, ah, oh, I'm done, I'm going to fall over. By the time you have filled up your stomach, it is still not yet the chemical that has been released to tell you you're full up. So you think you're hungry and you go on gorging whilst actually your body is full. Imam al kadhim alayhi salam has a hadith where he says the fountainhead of all illnesses to the body is when you overeat and fill your stomach more than it can handle. The fountainhead of all diseases. This is why famously, you know, the prophet is narrated to have said, divide your stomach into three, one third for food, one third for drink, one third for air, space. SubhanAllah, look how the Prophet was telling us 1400 years ago. Science is now telling us that you will gorge, you will continue eating, you will be full, but you won't realize it and you'll continue to eat and eat and eat. And that's why we end up just slouching and falling asleep. This is the fountainhead of all bodily diseases. The study says, the scientific study suggests that when we are watching TV, what's happening in our brain is dopamine is being released. We're happy. We're, we're just eating, eating, eating. Dopamine is being released. 
And so actually the balance between dopamine and that chemical that is supposed to tell you when you're full, there's now an imbalance. It takes even longer for those receptors to tell you that you are full because your concentration, the dopamine in your brain is being focused not on the release of food into your body, but the dopamine is being released by the film that you're watching, by the series that you're watching. Let alone all of the family issues that we're not talking to each other. We don't get to see one another. We don't get to learn how each and every one's day is, what we're having to deal with, what we're learning from each other. Look at what the ayah said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the way in which you should be is muttaki'ina alayha mutaqabileen. Sit with each other face to face and be talking and engaged with one another, not engaged on that satanic box. يَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلْدَانٌ مُخَلَّدُونَ now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam have gifted to us a number of different sunnah. And I'll just be brief, and I'd like you to note these down inshallah if you can. Just note them down, even if you uh, wrote them down in English, even if you remember them, you can go back to the lecture tomorrow and find it. The first thing is that when the table is spread out, you know when you first come and you see the table or you are laying out the table, there is a dua for you to recite. Many dua, but I'll just mention one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being praised here. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when he would spread out the table, when he would see the table being spread, Bismillahi, Allahumma ja'allaha ni'matan mashkuratan tasiru biha ni'mat al-jannah. In the name of Allah, make it an appreciated blessing by means of which the bounties of paradise are attained. This is the dua, one of the dua that is mentioned that you're supposed to say when you lay out the table. After that, when we sit down, what is the first thing that we are recommended to be able to take? A pinch of salt. Ahl al-Bayt have the narration where they say, a pinch of salt at the beginning and the end of the meal does away with 70 diseases of the stomach. The very famous story by our Maraja al-Kiram, may Allah bless them. One day, His Eminence Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Abul Qasim al-Khu'i rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi invited many of the leading maraja of Najaf, leading ulama of Najaf to a dinner. As they were about to sit to eat, Sayyid Khu'i said, please, Bismillah, start your meal. One of the senior scholars, Ayatollah Taliqani, refused to eat. He's just sitting there, not eating. He turned to him and said, you know, can you tell me what's wrong? Why are you not eating? Why are you just, everyone else has put food on their plate. You haven't touched anything. He said the sunnah of the prophet was to start with a pinch of salt. There is no salt here. He said, he says, no problem. He calls the worker. He says, can you bring some salt? The worker goes back into the kitchen, comes back out, whispers in the ear of Sayyid al-Khu'i, there's no salt. There's no salt in the house. Completely out. What do you mean you know, we don't have salt? There's no salt. Ayatollah Talaqan is looking, I'm not starting. It's the sunnah. I'm not breaking the sunnah. Now you know, sometimes when there's an argument over dinner, it gets a little bit tense, right? Everyone's eating, but they're like, but how can you eat if Ayatollah Talaqan is not eating? So everyone's not eating now. To break the tension, Sayyid al-Khu'i rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi responds by saying, Ayatollah Taliqani, look, it's great that you are so held to this sunnah. But you're stopping everybody else from being able to enjoy their meal. If you are so holding on to this sunnah, why didn't you bring a packet of salt yourself? Don't come to my house and ask for salt. If it's so important to you, carry the salt with you. Ayatollah Taliqani opens his jubba, takes out a packet of salt and says, I did carry salt with me. I just wanted to remind everyone of the sunnah of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Let's go back to the ayat and conclude them insha'Allah. يَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلْدَانٌ مُخَلَّدُونَ Verse number 18. بِأَكْوَابٍ وَأَبَارِيقَ وَكَأْسٍ مِّنْ مَعِينٍ Ayatollah al-Mudarasi says that based upon this verse, 
the verse in heaven, what the sunnah is in heaven, what's the first thing that you should be doing? Drinking. Read the verse. What's in front of you? بِأَكْوَابٍ وَأَبَارِيقَ وَكَأْسٍ مِّنْ مَعِينٍ Goblets and cups filled with drinks from a running spring. Accordingly, he says, the next sunnah is to start your meal with a drink. What's the next verse? Everybody follow, please, inshallah. Verse number 19. لَا يُسَدَّعُونَ عَنْهَا وَلَا يُنزِفُونَ A drink by which their mind will not be clouded. وَفَاكِهَةٍ مِمَّا يَتَخَيَّرُونَ And then there will be fruits available to them to eat. Ayatollah Mudaris, he says, based upon this ayah, the second thing that you should start with is fruits. Any fawakih, any fruits, any vegetables, have it on your table and fill your plate first with fruits and vegetables. Have this first, eat this as part of your meal, have it first. And then what is the last verse? وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ And then you should eat the actual meal. Whatever it might be, rice, chicken, kebab, pizza, whatever you guys are into, that is it. At the end of it, you also make sure that you have said your alhamdulillah, you finish with a pinch of salt, and then there is a dua when you clear up the table. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ali is narrated to have said, Allahumma aktharta wa, at- wa-, wa atabta wa barakta fa ashba'ta wa, wa arwayta. Alhamdulillah alladhi yut'imu wa la yut'am. Oh Allah, you have increased your bounties and made them good and blessed. Therefore, making us full and quenched of our thirst. All praise belongs to Allah, the one who nourishes and is not nourished. Simple steps. Practice. Apply them one by one. You know, don't do all five of them, ten of them at once. It becomes overwhelming. Practice one. Perfect it. Add the next one. Perfect it. Until this one act of yours represents Islam hakiki, Proper Islam. You are the perfect example of Islam. Anyone in the world can come to you and say, this is what Islam preaches. This is the way you and I are supposed to act. Think about this carefully. Aliyun al-Akbar alayhi salam was described in what way? Shabihil? Shabihil? Rasulillah. The one who resembled the Prophet. Khulqan wa khalqa. Think about this. Think about this. Aliyun al Akbar resembled the Prophet not just khalqan, not just in the way in which he looked, but also in his speech, in his actions, in his etiquettes. Khulqa. What does this mean to you? You know, we'll, we'll recite it. Our Qari will recite it. We will weep over Ali al Akbar. Remember, Hussein alayhi salam is not to be remembered seasonally, not only emotionally, not only intellectually, but to apply what we learn and to stay far away from the opposite actions. Applying Ali al Akbar tells us that if we want to be like him, it is to be like the Prophet. Which means that the way in which his akhlaq was khulqan wa khalqa, that he represented the Prophet. This is how you become khulqan wa khalqa of the Prophet. Shabih of the Prophet himself. When we say Ali al Akbar sounded like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi imagine when Ali al Akbar recited that adhan on the day of Ashura imagine how the heart of Zainab and Kulthum must have broken at that moment hearing a voice and an adhan that reminded them of the Prophet himself we are told 
in the books of Maqtal and our poets tell us that when Bilal al-Habashi returned after the attack on the house of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam she said, Oh Bilal, just once recite the adhan for me again so I may remember what it was like with my father Rasulullah. That security, that peace, that joy, that happiness. We are told that Bilal had taken an oath never to recite the Adhan again. But when Fatima al Zahra asks you, you recite the Adhan for her. We are told he recites the Adhan Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. When he reaches Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam collapses in grief at remembering what it was like at the time of her father. Imagine then when Ali al Akbar recites the Adhan, how Zainab and Umm Kurthum must have felt. I imagine that they too must also have collapsed to the floor. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Jadda, they have surrounded us. They have cut off the water from us. Our children are crying out, Al Atash, Al Atash, Ya Rasulullah, do you know what is going to happen to your beloved Hussein in a few minutes time you can imagine the pain that Zainab and Umm Kulthum must be feeling we are told that when Ali al-Akbar is struck in his chest with that dagger he is laying slumped in his horse over his horse the enemy came picked up that spear and lifted Ali al-Akbar into the air and threw him to the ground. This is what happened to Ali al-Akbar, the one who resembled the Prophet the most.